Hey there, entrepreneurs. My name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives, and thought leaders, and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Rafael Hernandez to the show. Rafael is the founder of Alfred Lane. Uh, Alfred Lane is a company that creates a line of personal and home fragrances handcrafted in small batches out of their Miami studio. And today I'm going to ask Rafael a few questions about his entrepreneurial journey and some of the strategies and tactics that he has used to start and grow his business. So Rafael, thank you so much for joining me today. Trip. Thank you so much for having me. So interesting business. Um, can you share a little bit about what your business is about, what products you're selling and how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, so uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we have a line of personal and home fragrances. Uh, we make in small batches. Uh, <clears throat> uh, those entail uh, candles, wreath diffusers, incense cones, room sprays. And then on the personal side, we have a line of roll-on cologne and um, solid cologne. We started the business 10 years ago. This is actually our 10-year anniversary. Um, I, I started it with um, this idea of wanting to build a physical uh, product business. Um, around the same time, um, I stumbled upon this concept of solid perfume. Essentially, it's like a wax-based scented balm, but they only had that for women. When I uh, So I went, walked into this boutique and this boutique had like a few fragrances for women. I asked if they had something like that for men. They didn't. And uh, prior to that experience, I had encounters where my bottles would get uh, broken during travel. You know, when I wouldn't, I didn't know how to travel light back in the day. Um, and then also, you know, things would get confiscated from TSA. Started kind of putting things together and I didn't see any any major players doing solid cologne and a little YouTube tutorial, a couple of, uh, uh, you know, got some like very basic equipment to do like a double boiler and tons of experimentation. Eventually I learned how to create a formula that worked well. And then that was the birth of uh, Alfred Lane. Wow, that's very interesting. And, you know, first of all, congratulations on your 10 year anniversary. Um, Thank you. Looking back, like, do you, um, you know, started out with, you know, something you realized you needed and you couldn't find it in the market? Yes. Um, you know, but that's always, not always an indication that, you know, a, business, a product would, uh, you know, others would be interested in, in buying that product. Uh, when you start when you started out with this idea, did you go through some sort of an idea validation process uh, where you know you're going to spend a significant amount of time trying to build this product or create this product uh, to try to test the market to see if other people would be interested in buying this thing yeah, that you're that's, creating? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, you, you you're absolutely right. Just because something uh, might solve your uh, your itch, your, you know, you, you can scratch your itch. You can kind of, you can possibly make the educated guess that someone else is experiencing the same problem, but to what extent is something that you need to validate. So um, I spent about three months coming up with some of uh, my background is in design, graphic design. I created the packaging and the logo, you know, came up with the name for the, for the three fragrances, worked on the packaging, I used my iPhone back then to take pictures of this uh, of this um, of this solid cologne. Created a, a a line sheet, and so my my idea was well, there's two traditional routes that you can go. You can sell it online, which then you have to figure out a way to drive traffic to your website, and then also another form of distribution would be to sell via wholesale uh, to retailers. So once I had a um a an offering so I, I designed the the three fragrances and then um also worked with a local uh, uh, uh carpenter to put together this point of sale kind of uh setup where you can place 
your uh, the solid colognes and display it. Uh, it's a point of display rather, mm -hmm. uh, so that you can uh, house it in your store. What we did, what I did was I walked to my local men's boutiques uh, in the street where you know I was making my solid colognes, and actually the first store that I landed was that initial store where I asked if they had solid colognes. It had been three months since since the first time I walk, walked in there. They didn't remember me. Mm -hmm. I tried to kind of have a little pitch ready for them to sell them on why they should carry this product and how they don't have anything like that for men and you know they should give us a try. And because they didn't have anything like that for men and it was a small order, um, you know, I, I just said, hey, if, if, if it doesn't sell, you know, you just let me know. They that became my first um my, my first store that that uh picked up the product. I used then that store to get into other stores saying, hey, look, I'm in that store and mm -hmm. you know they're doing well with it. And little by little, I kind of started leveraging these different accounts against other accounts to start sort of locally first and then regionally. Uh, then uh, nationally, and eventually I started uh, carrying, uh, I, I started reaching out to international stockists to carry my products. So now I also get carried in um, eight eight countries. Wow, that's really great. So is your business now, is your business more on the wholesale, um, bigger on the wholesale side, or is it really, um, you know, what's the distribution between direct to consumer versus wholesale? it's it's actually kind of 50 50 because while I was doing that, I also reached out to a lot of bloggers back then, you know, everyone wanted to blog. That was sort of like the being the influencer of that time. And I would send bloggers my product in exchange for a review. And a lot of that kind of got picked up by some of these larger blogs and like, and, and, or, and uh, magazines like Men's Journal and GQ, they, they started featuring me. Uh, and I did it like without me knowing that they were featuring me, I would just see a bunch of hits on the website and conversions. Uh, so our traffic a lot largely is attributed to uh, organic, you know, content that's been written by, bloggers back in the day or by these larger um, uh, publications that have decided to feature. They like the form factor, they like the story. And uh, so at this at this point is, is fairly even. Uh, I do have um, uh, a healthy email list that I've acquired, uh, I've amassed over the years. And then with that, also uh, a good amount of retailers that carry my products and are able to tell that story through um throughout their in their community and with their with their customers so have you always been the entrepreneurial type because i mean it's one thing to be able to see an idea and, and think sure this could make, potentially make a business because you know if you want to bring something to market you, there, there has to be a certain passion behind it right so you have to have some force behind that idea so were you, I mean, were you just an entrepreneurial tribe that you said, okay, this, this could be an idea, let me test it out and you just moved forward? Or what, did you have some sort of a passion around this whole idea of, you know, uh, fragrances and, and things like that, that really um, helped you to, because I mean, I, I see ideas, you know, uh, every day, but because I don't feel and passionate enough about something, I don't move forward because it, you know, building a business is, you know, you're, it's a commitment. Like you're spending what 16 more hours every day trying to build and bring an idea to, uh, to fruition. So can you share a little bit about, you know, what, what really motivated you to create a business like this? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, it's got a couple of answers. One, I don't, when I first started the business, I would have not, I wouldn't have thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but looking back uh, at my childhood, my I would do a lot of like bartering and trading, and like my mom would make food and I didn't want to eat it, so I would mm -hmm. sell I would sell my uh, my schoolmates my food in exchange of like money or their food or 
So there was this idea of like, I understand the value that I bring to the table and somebody wants it. Um, if I wanted, you know, to go on a trip or if I wanted something like my mom would help me, Hey, so we're going to make cupcakes and then you're going to sell it in school. And that money is going to help you <clears throat> one to pay me back. Cause I'm buying the, the ingredients, but then mm -hmm. two, the remaining of it is going to be for whatever it is that you want to spend. And so some, <clears throat> some of that was, uh, part of my, my upbringing, uh, same with like the idea of saving, um, then I joined the corporate world, uh, here in the States after I graduated college, my goal was to, you know, really kind of rise through the ranks, uh, the corporate ladder, uh, be a successful creative director and, you know, work on amazing brands and with, with, you know, on amazing projects with amazing brands. Uh, but it came to a point where, you know, I, I read the four hour work week, Tim Ferriss, very a uh, seminal book for a lot of entrepreneurs, this idea of like, you can leverage your, your location, make more money um, by living in cheaper places, or you can, you can have an experience, you can have a life full of experiences by thinking about those experiences in a different way with a different lens. And um, then I, around that time, I also started traveling and, you know, if you want to travel and you're working in a typical nine to five, looking at only having 15 days, you know, if that 10 days to 15 days of vacation time. So th that kind of all merged together in this idea of like, you know what, I, I want to have the, you know, location freedom. I want to, I want to build something of value that would enable me to have the lifestyle that I desire. And the the passion comes from wanting that. How mm. I get there is more like it's just a a, a means to an end. I'm yeah. very passionate about the fragrances. I just happen to like it because I grew up um, wearing fragrances. I would take my dad's fragrances all the time, and you know I would steal it and uh, wear wear his stuff. So I I knew that that was kind of built in. I I already sort of knew what worked during the summer or versus the winter. But if I didn't have the fragrance business, I think that I could do other things. And as long as it helped me get to the the, the goal of being able to travel and just own my time. Yeah, I think many entrepreneurs, if not all, are driven by this idea of have, con having the control over their own time and, and freedom. Um, have you, you know, since you've started the business, have you been able to achieve some of that or you know, have you been able to travel more uh, or, I mean, which so often happens that you get so much into the business that <laughs> you're working, even though you still have your control of your time? Yeah, you know, I, I have. So <clears throat> I have achieved the freedom to do uh, the things that I want to do uh, travel, meet really cool people, uh, take on new hobbies, um, and, and, and be able to learn a lot, which is something that, that I'm very passionate about, just kind of constantly be challenged and, and grow. Um, but, um, it comes at a very steep price. Yes, you do have to, you know, work, work a lot. Uh, sometimes the business requires more and, um, and, is maybe around like year five of me owning the business, I learned that, um, I, well, I learned that I cannot feel comfortable in the business because the moment that you start feeling too comfortable in the business, I feel like that's when business kind of goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been my experience that that's the case. So I always have this like just low level anxiety that, all right, things are going well, but like, I still need to think about, you know, growing or, or expanding or figuring out what it, or, or if I'm just kind of okay with it, where it is being purposeful about it rather than just being reactive to it. Um, but yeah, I have had the, like last year I got to travel the year before I got to travel even more. And um, now I get to choose how to spend my time. Uh, the business does ask or require a lot of my time though. So 
you know, that now I'm getting to a point where it's like, okay, let's think about delegating and scaling and automating as much as possible so that I'm, wor I'm working less in the business and working more on the business. Do you have any uh, team members or are you, is it? Yeah, yeah. So right now I have a full-time um, operations uh, specialist. Uh, she runs the, the studio and helps with the day-to-day. And then I have folks on a, um, I have a, a handful of folks that are on a, as needed basis. Um, but because we're we're kind of a small but mighty team of just very efficient um, uh, makers, uh, I have the, the the part of the the reason why I opened up a studio was because up until 2020 i was making everything out of my house and i wanted to formalize the business and in, in a way that i could grow it um, i also started getting picked up by larger retailers so i wanted i wanted to handle that um the demand and be able to scale quickly so um that that's where we are right now so you're still managing all the manufacturing yourself like you haven't outsourced that yet no, we make we make everything uh, in small batches by hand. So we pour everything by hand. Uh, you know, our team does the whole thing end to end. Um, we haven't, you know, I, I've had this debate internally with like, okay, so part of the the growth might require me eventually handing this off to a a manufacturing facility. Um, we haven't hit that critical point yet, uh, but also even if I did. I have often thought that maybe what I wanted to do is get more folks because I would have more control over, um, you know, the quality, uh, the processes, the, the, the whole experience of, um, uh, making the product, but then also talking about the product and even, you know, the, the, the customer experience, uh, once we you know, decide to ship things to them, making sure that like, for, for example, fulfillment is something that we still do internally. Uh, we've done fulfillment houses or centers that handle our product. And there's a big gap between how we want the customer to perceive the product and how it gets to them. And so that brand, we really focus on that brand story and connecting with the customer and providing, you know, impeccable customer service because that's the thing that i think differentiates us from from other folks okay um so you started out with a product that did not exist in the market which was you know predominantly like a male uh fragrance um uh, uh what was it called um yeah cologne. it's a solid cologne now, there, there were a few um just you know, super high end. Uh, there, there was like one brand that's still around that's high end. They're they're based out of France, uh, and then one or two others, but none of the fragrances that I would have liked. So there, there were more. This has been around since you know Egyptian times. Now that uh, I go to markets, folks that are kind of like older generation, they're like, oh, I remember this solid cologne back in the seventies. I used to wear mm. that kind of thing. So. It's just that in the form factor that I presented it back in 2013, that th there wasn't that uh, available at that time. Okay, but now have you moved into the the, the women's um, fragrance market also, or are you still focused completely on the the same like men? Uh, that's men? a good that's a good question. Yeah, so we started originally uh, with uh, men's products, and then as uh, five years ago, we released um, the home fragrance side of uh, the business. So we went into room sprays and candles and the design has been, you know, it's very clean, minimalist. Um, and initially, uh, the the reason for moving into that was because also like in the, you know, uh, beauty, if you will, category, there are more options for women. And not as many options for men, especially like grooming. Grooming has boomed greatly in the last 10 years. Uh, but when I first started Alpha Lane, there was not that much of a, a, a focus on providing, you know, the male audience with grooming products. And so you you have your like Dollar Shave Clubs and you have all of these 
companies doing beard oil. And so it, it happened around that time. Now it's the market's a lot more saturated and has evolved greatly. And Dollar Shave Club got acquired by, you know, one of the, the I think it was um, one of these large shaving companies. But um, I haven't, while I haven't come out with fragrances for women, we've tried to introduce more universal fragrances that appeal to to, to everyone. Um, and that's more of the ethos of what I'm trying to now uh, evolve the brand to, right? So I'm trying to tell the story of, initially the names of the, of the colognes were around how I imagined men feeling, you know, sort of thinking about positive qualities or, you know, it, it, it makes this one particular fragrance can make you feel really good and you feel confident and you feel like you can, you know, do really well in a job interview or you feel like, oh, I'm going to have this awesome date because I feel great. And I, so, so that kind of a positive um, uh, em empowerment on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also have seen customers come to me that like the room sprays and they like making it part of their ritual of making their bed and doing using a little room spray to kind of freshen up their their linens and then getting into you know at night getting into under the blankets and it smells nice so i i'm definitely thinking more about how i can create experiences not just for men but just for everyone in general how does one use this solid cologne it's basically just uh, put it on your fingers and you know dab it on your neck or something or yeah so you use your finger and you know with the warmth of your you know of your uh, your body heat it kind of warms up the the wax and you put it in your pulse points you know you can do like neck uh wrists um i even use it whenever i'm traveling for um because it's got shea butter and uh really nice oils i put it on my beard um, I also, you can use it as like a moisturizer as well, like an aftershave. Um, but yeah, it's super simple, very easy to just throw in a dot kit or your, your, your having your, um, in your desk drawer or, you know, even your pocket or gym bag and having something that doesn't break. Uh, some folks like more of the, the, the more, um, like stronger form factors. So the Roland colognes are that alternative. And then, yeah, in the future, we're we're looking to roll out more of the traditional uh, perfumes and, and colognes. Okay. Um, a little bit more on the market. Um, so, of course, you know, this category, uh, I think there's so, so much competition out there. So many different big brands and also now, you know, uh, smaller um companies that, you know, more direct to consumer kind of brands that have come up, where do you see your company in this, uh, you know, highly competitive landscape? And, you know, what is it that is helping you to carve a niche for your own business um, within all this competition and all these different, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, if I want to buy like a candle, um, there's, there's so many options out there, right? So how, how would someone build a, a connection with your brand and want to want to purchase your brand rather than like uh, go for a different option? Yeah, that's a really great question and uh, one of an existential nature. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I ask myself often if the if I would start this business in 2023, and because you know I, I'm I'm looking back a lot. I'm being very retrospect uh, introspective and kind of retrospective as well. Uh, looking back at the last ten years, everything that I've learned, um, and um, ten years for a business is like a hundred years and dog years. I feel like I mean. Yeah. I, 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 I know the, I have fought like hell to be here, um, you know, 10 years. I know that the, the, there's, you hear statistics thrown around, like most businesses don't make it after year one. The whole thing, mm -hmm. I, I, I the, this business was not prepared to go through a pandemic and then like inflation and a possible recession. But um, so I'm not sure that I would 
start a new fragrance business at this point because it is incredibly hard. Um, I think that the reason why people have bought from me versus other brands is because they like the story um, of how I started the business, but then also the fact that, you know, I'm an immigrant. I'm, mm -hmm. I was born and raised in Venezuela, came to the United States, learned English here at age 12, uh, went to school and, you know, nothing has been given to me. Uh, we've worked really hard to, you know, become like citizens and then become educated. I paid my way through educate, you know, through college. And then, you know, I bootstrapped through the, I bootstrapped the business. I haven't taken any investment money, you know, and we make, we're very passionate about the products that we make so much so that, you know, we, we could be bigger but if it's a, to the detriment of quality or servicing our customers or providing that experience that we we know we can provide, I'd rather grow more slowly. Um, again, you know, it's it's tough to say that because you know the realities of the marketing, the, the realities of the competition. But we have a really compelling story um, of believing in American ingenuity and making things here in the United States. And you know, uh, create solving problems in creative ways and coming up with things that enhance people's lives, right? So, I'm just thinking about the candle. Yes, you can get candles anywhere. You can get su super cheap candles. You can get more more expensive candles. But our intent is to make sure that you have a very specific experience with this candle. That even if it's just as simple as lighting it after you get home from work. Um, and it's it's something that helps you relax as part of your your winding down you know ritual that we helped you facilitate we helped you with that and we facilitate help you facilitate that experience. Is there such thing as can you um, copyright or have some sort of an intellectual property around you know the the fragrance signature that you're coming up with like you know the the fragrance that you have no one else has and if somebody really likes it then they can only get it from your place or is it that you know the fragrances that you have you know there are, there are other options also yeah that's a that's a great question um <clears throat> kind of hard to copyright that um also there's markets you know there there's folks that make replicas of you know fat high fashion perfume mm -hmm. um I, I don't really worry too much about folks copying my my stuff if they want to. You know, yeah, you can get a Louis Vuitton purse or you can get a knockoff. Yeah, that can be a problem if it's really cutting into your revenue um, or it's hurting your or damaging your brand. But my focus is mainly on just continue to be the original Alpha Lane creating, you know, really great fragrances and you know different form factors that um i think my customers will like and if folks try to you know copy that you know i like i'm, I'm focused on the growth i don't want to focus so much on it hasn't been an issue at the moment i guess that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> okay okay um so speaking about, you know, telling, sharing your story with your audience, right? Um, how do you do that? I mean, you, you said that people find you th through your organic, uh, you know, SEO, but in terms of other marketing outreach, you know, who is your target market and um, how do you get in front of them so that you're acquiring customer? Um, and then we can talk more about, you know, what do you do once you have that customer? Sure. So the, the few ways that I acquire customers on the wholesale side, I go to trade shows and that is really helpful to connect with uh, retail partner, potential retail partners or independent boutique owners or buyers that are interested in sourcing brands. They might, I just came back from um, a trade show called Shop Object in New York. 
and I connected with a few uh, store store owners that are were interested in uh, giving us a try, and they might have different price points of the same products, or they might not have what we have to offer. And so, the nice thing about those trade shows for me is that I can tell my story, you know, for a for a specific fee. All of the buyers, you know, come into this trade show. I I tell them what we're all about. They can sample the different products and see what they think because they know their customers better than I know their customers. And, you know, we, we write purchase orders at that um, in that moment. Um, from a retail, from a direct to consumer perspective, I also do markets. So those are not scalable. <laughs> so I can't like do all these markets like, uh, as the only way of um, acquiring customers. But I do travel around the country to uh, specific markets uh, that are more artisanal in nature that might be curated. You might even have to interview to be accepted into them uh, to maintain the quality of the market. And those markets also tend to do a really good job of advertising that, hey, these are artisanal unique products and and they draw pretty big, big crowds and, and those have been successful. Last, I've been doing a lot of um, uh, blog posts, so I'll, I'll reach out to um, uh, different writers. And what I like to do is come up with ideas for, hey, you know, because uh, everybody now knows about solid cologne, or at least in the fashion industry. It just seems to be like an article about solid cologne as an alternative to spray every couple of days. But what I might do is like pitch them an angle and try to give, provide some value as to like, hey, have you thought about this? And by the way, we might, you know, here's a, my product happens to do this, but here's some, some other brands that you might want to consider. So it's not, I'm thinking not just about myself, but then I'm also thinking more about how to make the lives of like these writers uh, easier. You know, they can, maybe they haven't heard that story or maybe they can think of, that story and put their own spin on it. And that has yielded some really great results, cold outreach or just simply, and they usually, if you're, if you keep them in mind, they will reply or they'll keep you uh, in the loop for future stories. So I'm, I'm, I've tried that idea of like, let me add a little value to the conversation or in terms of, in the form of ideas or concepts or, you know, um, potential blog blog post uh, angles. And um, that's resulted a lot into uh, blog posts that either get picked up by larger corporate, uh, larger organizations or publications rather. Um, and those, those are organic, right? So those are that long tail effect, you know, benefits me when people are searching for, you know, whatever products I'm being featured for. So you're not doing any paid advertising? No. Um, once I acquire those customers, I do uh, email marketing, um, <clears throat> but I don't, I don't, I've tried paid advertising. Um, you know, that is a, it's a big, <laughs> it's a really uh, big undertaking for me. And given everything else that I got going on, I haven't had the time to devote fully into it to know I've done enough work where I'm like, okay, I just need to either hire someone to do it or I need to hire someone to do it essentially. But, but um, because I have these other avenues that work uh, fairly well, I have paused those. I put those on, on hold until, you know, further notice. Okay. Um, in terms of your fulfillment, strategy can you share is it all in-house are you do you warehouse and ship everything um on your own or um do you use any third-party uh, companies also yeah no i i we house everything we have house our inventory we fulfill everything um <clears throat> we we fulfill both our wholesale and retail um and then the next few months i'll i'll be hiring a um, a fulfillment, uh, someone specifically just to do fulfillment, um, because mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a, a pretty hefty, uh, time suck. Um, but a very important one, because again, 
to, to my point earlier, I'd want to make sure that um, that brand story experience is uh, carries through all the way till the end uh, to, to the delivery of the, the goods to the customer. Um, so we we do handle everything in our uh, Miami studio. Okay. Um, you did mention that you're selling in international markets also. Um, I'm assuming that US is your biggest biggest market. Uh, and I also saw on your website, I believe you're using like uh, marketplaces, like wholesale marketplaces like FAIR. Um, can you share a little bit about uh, the channels and markets? Are you also on like Amazon uh, where you're selling? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are not on Amazon. Um, a lot of our retail partners have chosen to carry our products because we've decided not to uh, sell on Amazon. Okay. Um, you know, we're we're aware of the uh, potential opportunities that might have been missed, uh, but I think that for the we, we really take pride in owning the relationship with the customer and being able to talk to them if they need to and service them in you know, whatever way they need to. When you work with someone like Amazon, you lose that connection with the customer. You don't get their email addresses. You don't have that ownership. Um, and so um, we sell strictly uh, online uh, through my you know online store. But then also we've done partnerships with, um, in the past, we've done partnerships with Bespoke Post, which is a subscription box. That's been really nice and, and, and a really cool way to discover our products. That's another way that folks have gotten to learn about Alfred Lane. Uh, we did a sampling box with Birchbox uh, five years ago. Um, in one of the trade shows that we did, we got picked up by Saks Fifth Avenue. So we're now, uh, they are our first large uh, retailer. And that's been wonderful to kind of learn that side of, you know, it's 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 different to work with, you know, a, a large retailer like them uh, than to work with uh, some of the more independent boutique owners. Um, and the wholesale front, I do um, sell through fair.com. It's probably the most popular, the largest uh, wholesale marketplace. I also use Bulletin, uh, bulletin.co. Um, and then on the international side of things, I use Piba. Uh, most of my um, international customers are in Southeast Asia. So South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, um and i'm thinking i'm missing one or two others um other than that it's uh canada and i used to sell a little bit more in europe um france and spain and england but uh regulations there are pretty stringent so um i have i've paused that um uh servicing that market until we kind of make sure that we do things right. That's really interesting. So why Southeast Asia? Do you, were you are you able to discover what, uh, why, why there is a demand in that region? Yeah, I've asked myself that question. I think that it's a combination of, I think we people like our scents and they like the design. It's a very clean design. Um, I also kind of think that because it's a, it's an American brand, and we we really take pride in the process and in the you know sourcing high quality ingredients and we take pride in the quality of the product. Um, one thing that I've learned about, for example, the Japanese market, is that they love bourbon, and it, and you know you can only get bourbon in the United States. It has to be made in the United States for it to be bourbon. Um, and uh, a lot of my friends say, yeah, back home, you know, having you know, Maker Smart or Knob Creek or one of these, you know, bourbons, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's it's good stuff. They they really love those uh, the products that we produce here and then export to the rest of the world. 
So I think that it, it, they, it is interesting that they, they have found an affinity for the, the things that we offer. And uh, they, before the pandemic, they made a large portion of my business. Um, it suffered a lot because, you know, Asia got hit pretty heavily with like the lockdowns and supply chain issues. So the, the demand has slowed down a little bit, but we still um, get a lot of our um, business from uh, Southeast Asia. Did you have to do anything to adapt to that market? Like, are you still able to sell at the same price point that you sell it in the US or do you have, did you have to modify that and do anything else to, to cater specifically to that market? No, um, and I've asked that, and no, they, the the folks when I first started shipping directly to the different stores, uh, you know, the the biggest challenge with servicing that market is shipping. It's incredibly expensive. It's in, it's expensive to ship here internally in the United States, um, but to ship out there is really expensive. Um, thankfully, when I started selling out there, my products tend to be on the lighter side. So a solid cologne is 0.5 ounces, not, not too, too heavy. You do a couple of those boxes, you're looking at, you know, five, 10, 15 pounds. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't had the, I haven't had to change or modify much to address that or to, uh, you know, or the packaging. That's the other thing. Like they, they haven't required or asked to, for me to do things differently. Um, but uh, yeah, that the shipping is probably like the, and, and the shipping situation is also kind of tough to uh, Europe. So it, it, that's the, that's probably the single, the number one factor for, you know, why a retailer might say, hey, um, can you, can you do a, a deal where you, eat up half the cost of shipping. And sometimes I might do it if I see that it might it might yield a long-term relationship, which is really what I want. I want to build these, you know, like long-term relationships with retail. And so that that's something that uh that I do. I do keep the prices the same. Um, what they might do on their end is mark mark them up a little bit more so that they can recoup some of the um, the tariffs that get imposed in their country. Um, and, and usually I'm fine with it because um, it, it respects the minimum advertised product, uh, minimum advertised price. Um, but uh, yeah, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, do you, um, you, you, you consider your product, I mean, it is, I would consider it more, more of a luxury item, right? Like this, uh, the price price point, of course, I'm I'm sure you've done testing and, and thought about your pricing and things like that. Yeah, um, it's like it's medium tier. Um, okay. it, it's not. They're definitely not um, cheap. Uh, you know, you can find things a lot cheaper in some of the big box stores. Um, I've seen some of the more expensive, you know, uh, more luxurious brands that might sell a candle for. 80, 90, hundred dollar, hundred twenty dollars. We're we're in sort of that middle range, um, especially for the form factor that we offer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I would say that mid tier is kind of where we we land on the price points. Okay. Um, looking into the future, what you know, where do you see your business? I mean, to, to me, it seems like you've come uh, 10 years and now you're getting into like you know, the bigger retailers like Saks and so forth. Um, looking ahead five years down the road, do you, do you still want to be doing this business? Do you want to be having other people running your business? You know, how do you, how do you see your business evolving? And um, yeah, what, what's your vision for the future? Yeah, that's a really great, great question. I would like to still do the business um, unless someone decided that they wanted to, you know, acquire the company or buy it. Um, I think that for the right price, you know, that's, that's, those are conversations that are worth having. Um, but five years from now, um, I'd like to continue to create part of the reason why I love doing what I do is because I get to create and 
um, design of products. Um, I'd like to expand the product lines to different form factors. Um, you know, there's some interesting uh, companies out there that can take your uh, your oils and then use you know sell those oils you know as like cartridges essentially for their diffusers that are electronic um and then you can use your iphone uh, an iphone app or a mobile app to control the strength intensity uh schedule it when you want it to turn on or turn off uh, something like that really interests me um also just um looking at for example two years ago i released a line of coffee and that was in partnership with um a uh 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 coffee roaster based out of tallahassee uh called lucky goat coffee company mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. essentially i said to them hey i would love to do a collaboration um i love coffee i love scents i feel like the the home side of things is all about experience. I also think that coffee is about experience. Waking up in the morning, bringing your beans, and creating like, you know, boiling the water and doing a French press or whatever, and having a cup of coffee as part of like that morning routine, it's very appealing to me. So I like to continue to do that. I have this dream of like someday maybe doing like a collaboration with Miscal um, brand and do like an Alfred Lane collaboration. Um, I love Mezcal. Um, I could do bourbon too. I don't know. I just, I think that the the nice thing about building Alfred Lane is that it, um, I don't just see it as a fragrance company. I see it as a company that facilitates experiences through fragrances or hopefully th through some other sensory, um, you know, experiences like, or or items like coffee or um mezcal or whatever <laughs> how is how is the coffee business going is, is it like uh, is, it, is it is it working <laughs> everyone everyone loves it uh the nice thing about the arrangement that i have with lucky goat is that um you know the minimum order quantities are are, are manageable for me um the folks I have a few folks that are in a subscription. Yeah, so I offer it as a sub subscription. They can get those in a recurring basis and they get um, a price point, a price break on those. Uh, it's been slow, to, to be honest with you. It's been slow, but everyone that has tasted it, they have found the one that they like and then they they reorder. So that's been, that's been nice. I haven't pushed it as hard because that's not the main focus of the business. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a nice... It's something that it's a secondary item. Um, that's also like, for example, you know, in the in the future, I'm going to release um, wick cutters. So when you burn your candle, you let it cool off, and then every time that you're going to relight it, you want to make sure that you um, trim your candle so that it burns cleanly. So that's like an ancillary side mm. uh, item that only helps helps increase average order value. It also helps it so that folks have the, what, what you experience, what, what your desired experience is uh, for them, so. Awesome. Now, <clears throat> in every business's um, uh, history, there's always some mistakes made, lessons learned, failures. You know, what is like one uh, big mistake or, you know, failure that, you think you endured during the last 10 years that really comes to mind. What did you learn from it? And what can other entrepreneurs learn uh, from your mistakes? Yeah. Um, take care of the house. <laughs> um, and by that, I mean, in every sense. So <clears throat> financially, mentally, psychologically, physically, take care of the house. You got to take care of yourself. Hmm. So the way that I would rec I would say that is, or the way that I would explain that is, um, you got to take care of your mental health. You can't just run yourself down to the ground thinking that you're gonna, you know, be optimal to run a business and make sound decisions if you don't take care of yourself. Same thing with eating, exercising, your health. If you don't take care of your health, your body's not gonna be able to take care of the business. Uh, financially, 
you, you know, the one mistake that I had was to, uh, if maybe you want to say like five years ago, no, it's probably six years ago, a little bit more, um, quit my job without having savings, mm -hmm. uh, because I thought, well, you know, I can, I'm just going to grind it out. I'm going to be able mm -hmm. to just grind so much that I don't need savings. And I had debt at the time. And I didn't have the financial platform to be able to withstand the 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 um the heavy back and forth or the slacking, if you will, of the uh, business and markets and recessions and you know that whole dynamic. Um, and then uh, yeah, so have a financial platform for yourself, have runway, have savings before you commit to the thing full time. Um, because what might happen, which is what happened to me, I had to then go back to get a, a full-time job and okay. still kind of run Alfred Lane and low power mode until I could get myself to a, a position where, um, I could quit my job. So I quit my job in 2020, um, uh, my full, my corporate gig, and then mm -hmm. the pandemic happened. Well, I, I've been able to withstand all of that more or less because of the savings that I um had for myself and that i didn't have any debt um but yeah also be flexible with the idea of like maybe maybe you can do your full-time business uh, or you can do your business and focus on that but um uh, like i also do consulting for businesses doing um mobile app design right so uh, that's not my primary focus my focus is alfred lane but at the same time those are interesting those kind of intertwine because they're both focusing on product design. One of it's digital, one of them is uh, physical. I think that's, uh, that's really key. You know, it's, you can't, you know, someone going hundred percent in the business, it's, it's probably going to work for like very few people. So I think it, it's, it's a key thing for any entrepreneur. If you have a job, keep your job, keep your full-time job and work on the business in the evening and, uh, Hopefully, uh, it works out. Yeah, if it's a to you after a while, then I think that you know, then you can have that conversation with yourself and say, "Am I willing to leave the stability of a of a job because I've seen that this business has a good enough track record of consistently, you know, performing the way that I want it to?" And then you can say, "Okay, I I can live off of this, or at least not have to put my my own money into it." Definitely. Now we're going to move on to our rapid fire segment. In this segment, I'm going to ask you a few quick questions and you have to answer them maybe in a couple of words or a sentence or so. The first one is one book recommendation for entrepreneurs uh, and why? Um, I was gonna say Atomic Habits by James Clear, okay. um, but I'm gonna switch it. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I would recommend one that I read a couple of times a, a year, at least twice a year, is uh, The Alchemist uh, by yeah. Paulo Coelho. Uh, reason being is that um, it it has a lot of little nuggets of wisdom that I kind of like, and the journey of entrepreneurship is really, really uh, difficult um, and long and arduous, and you could easily settle for something that is slightly less because it's nice, but it's not the ultimate goal that you wanted. That book is a nice reminder of like, yes, you could settle for something that's a little bit easier or more comfortable than what your desired goal is. But when you are in your deathbed, are you going to be happy that you did that? Or are you going to be happy that you went for the thing that you wanted? And even if you failed, you at least tried. So uh, The Alchemist is, is that book for me. Uh, the, um... Anyone who likes The Alchemist, I, there's another book um, called The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. Uh, so he was, I think, the, the the original author who kind of came up with this whole idea of, you know, he, he was like, I think, an uh, anthropologist or something. And he had looked at all the different, you know, religions and mythology and you know and 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 come up with this pattern of like this hero's journey uh so it's, it's, that's very uh, interesting and i think paulo Coelho's book uh, kind of follows that pattern also mm -hmm. 
an innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce, retail, or tech landscape that you feel excited about? Uh, Chat GPT. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you used it in any way or later on? Um, I've been kind of playing with the idea of um, <clears throat> uh, con uh, writing content. Okay. Uh, you know, for email marketing or for blog posts, um, we were working on releasing a blog post, uh, like a blog section to our website um, for not just, we want to be a source of like good information and and also obviously the good for SEO, but the the proposition of chat GPT as a, not maybe get us to a hundred percent there, but enough to, you know, have something to then draft down and pare down. It's really interesting. Chat GPT is exciting and scary at the same time, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a, business, <laughs> a business or productivity to the software that you would recommend or a productivity tip? Uh, the one that I use all the time and folks have a hate, uh, love-hate relationship with it and I understand why, but I still mostly love it is Evernote. Uh, okay. I house everything there swipe files uh music um uh links bookmarks the whole thing and i use that in combination with just regular apple notes um apple notes feels a little bit snappier and quick to sync across icloud evernote's more for like a repository so i use i use those two a startup or business in e-commerce retail or tech that you think is currently doing great things yeah, so uh, I, I mentioned sort of the concept earlier. Uh, there's a business called Pira, and I really like what they're doing. Essentially, they uh, they work with small brands like myself, and they come up with, they create these cartridges based on the fragrances that these small brands have, these small fragrance companies have, and then they provide the diffuser. They sell the re the, the diffuser that you can connect to the to the um, to uh, a socket and it comes with two tanks so you can kind of alternate between both uh fragrances they have a large his uh, uh, large bank or library of fragrances that you can choose from um, and then you can control it it has a little light which you can control the color and it has a, a mobile app that you can set the intensity the schedule i think it's a really interesting uh business that it's Part technology, part uh, physical product, part uh, you know experiential. It's it's an intersection that that is really interesting to me. Awesome. Uh, a peer, entrepreneur, or business person whom you look up to, or someone who inspires you. Um, Alex Ramosi. Um, okay. I really like uh, the things that he says. Uh, very practical. Very pragmatic. Very. You know, I don't feel like I'm getting preached at by him. Um, I think that he's just sharing his experience and, and in a very meaningful and real way. And he's very vocal about uh, telling you that what works for him might not work for you, but like he's open about sharing. So I, I really appreciate that. Great. And final question, uh, best business advice you ever received or, or you would give to other entrepreneurs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one that has been uh, constant across my career, and I could easily say that this also applies to live, is only take advice from folks that are doing uh, what you want to do and that are hopefully doing it well. Um, and, you know, even if you decide to do some of the things that they're doing or how they got there, you try to emulate those you know, those key steps or what what have you, realize that what worked for them may not work for you. And that's okay. Like there's an element of exploration that has to happen in anything that you do. Uh, but you want to, at, at least from a fr uh, frame of reference, you want to look at them and say, okay, is the person that's giving advice trying to get something from me? Or are they genuinely giving advice because they want to share their their experience? And um, you know, one should like the way that I take those pieces of advice is like, 
let me see if it works for me. And if it works for me, great. If it doesn't work for me, then that's okay. But at least having that healthy relationship of expectation versus reality of like, oh, I'm doing exactly what this person said and it's not working for me. Well, of course, because you're not that person and different journeys and different walks of life. But um, <clears throat> taking advice from folks that are doing um, the, the kinds of things that you want to do, I feel like it's it's a good way of at least helping you visualize uh, a better tomorrow for yourself and for your business. I think, yeah, that's, that's so, so important. I think these days you also find, you know, a, an aspiring entrepreneur can get into this, uh, uh, this negative cycle of, you know, buying courses or consuming courses from people who's, who are selling courses as their main source of revenue. And they may be teaching you about building a business or something. They're not like really building those businesses. <laughs> and I right. think that's the, uh, that's kind of like, uh, that's probably you're just wasting your time and money there. <laughs> so, well, Rafael, uh, those were all the questions that I had. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, thanks for sharing your story. If anybody watching this uh, video wants to get in touch uh, and purchase your products, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, you can go to alfredlane.com, A-L-F-R-E-D-L-A-N-E.com. Uh, you can uh, have access to all of our personal home fragrances and our coffee. And you can also find us on Instagram at Alfred Lane, fully spelled out. <clears throat> awesome. Well, thank you, Rafael, again. Really appreciate your time for sharing your story and uh, wish you all the very best uh, in your business. So thanks again for joining me today at Trip Talks. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time.